Hey everyone and welcome to a guide for Kingdom Two Crowns. This time we'll be covering a few general tips for the European and Shogun campaigns, so let's get started. Throughout the campaign, you're reminded to build, expand, defend. So we'll be covering those categories, starting with building. You start the campaign with the wood technology, which limits you in how much you can upgrade your kingdom and what buildings are available to you. You'll be able to upgrade your town centre three times after building it, and your walls and towers only once after building them. After that, you'll see a cross-through symbol when you stand by the structures, indicating that you can't upgrade them any further until you get the next tier of technology. Fortunately, you don't have to wait long, as the second tier of technology can be unlocked by rebuilding a stone mine on the second island of the campaign for 10 coins, allowing you to upgrade your structures further. The next and final tier of technology is unlocked by rebuilding an iron mine on the fourth island for 20 coins. When you upgrade your town centre to the first stone level, you unlock the Siege Workshop and Pikemen or Ninjas in the European and Shogun campaigns respectively. To get these structures to spawn, you have to have free space within your walls, meaning you'll have to expand your kingdom beyond its starting point. Upgrading your town centre again unlocks the ability to hire squires at your town centre and buy fire barrels from Siege Workshops for your catapults. The final town centre upgrade requires the iron technology and unlocks the forge, where you can upgrade squires to knights, and gives you the ability to build the bomb, which is required for destroying cliff portals. Upgrading your technology also allows you to upgrade your walls, making them stronger, and your archery towers, allowing more archers into them and eventually giving them a roof to protect from floaters. As mentioned earlier, some structures, such as the scythe vendor, Siege Workshop and Forge only spawn once you've got enough free space within your walls. So now we're going to focus on expanding your kingdom to get that space. Positioning is the first thing to consider when you're expanding to a new location. Generally you don't want to move too far in one go as it will take your builders a while to get to the wall, build it and then have your defensive units catch up. And depending on your timing you can end up facing a night wave with a low level or incomplete wall and nobody ready to defend it. So. Don't be overly ambitious with your expansion, though you can definitely move at least a couple of widths of the screen without any issue. The main goals of expansion are to have enough space for structures like the Siege Workshop to appear, as having a catapult is crucial to defending against strong greed attacks, and also so that you're closer to portals, so that when it's time to attack them, your troops don't have to travel as far and can avoid the risk of getting attacked by a night wave en route. You also ideally want to find a position that has one or two archery towers very near to the wall, giving you the potential for a stronger defence, and if you don't already, having a farm location within your walls is also very valuable, as it will give you a safe source of income in every season except winter. When it comes to chopping down trees to clear the area for your new walls, you'll also want to be aware of the location of any vagrant camps nearby. Chopping down the nearest trees to a vagrant camp will destroy it, creating a ruin that you can build a citizen house in for 8 coins, where you can then recruit citizens for 5 coins each. This is much more expensive than recruiting vagrants from a camp, so you ideally want to avoid destroying vagrant camps if they're in short supply. You may want to expand up to the vagrant camp and leave it standing so you can recruit vagrants more easily, but this will all depend on how much space you need. One potential way to get around this issue is seeing if you'd be able to keep the vagrant camp within your new walls by clearing trees backwards from beyond where your new walls would be. There aren't too many situations where this is possible, but it's worth bearing in mind. Otherwise, timing is also very important when expanding your walls. The best time to expand is usually after a natural blood moon, as the night after usually doesn't have a greed attack giving you two days and one night to set up your new defences before the next night attack. However, you can't always wait around for a blood moon before you expand, so the next best time to expand is immediately after your troops have defeated the last greed of any night attack, as this gives you the maximum time before the next night attack arrives. Though, if you want to be cautious, you might want to wait until the very start of the next day so that you can see if it will be a blood moon or not, indicated by the Roman numerals being in red. When it comes to the expansion itself, make sure you've got a lot of coins ready, as you should have enough time to build the walls and upgrade them to at least level 3, maybe even level 4 if you're not expanding too far. If there's a nearby archery tower, then it's worth building that and adding a level or 2 to it as well if you've got the coins, and if your expansion causes the siege workshop to spawn, then it's also worth building a catapult to help with the defence. 
so again, it's worth having a lot of coins available. All this, combined with having a good amount of archers and maybe a squire or two, should mean that your new defences can last against the first night wave it faces, before you can then upgrade the wall and any towers further. That covers expanding, so now it's on to defending. We've already covered a few points to do with defending, but we'll go into a bit more depth. Obviously you want to have strong walls, as these are quite literally your first line of defence, and the more they're upgraded, the more health they'll have. Another way to increase a wall's health is with the Statue of Building, which can be unlocked on the third island for 3 gems and 9 coins, and allows builders to add an extra buff to walls, increasing their health by roughly 80%. Beyond your walls, your main form of defence is your archers, and the more you have, the better, so it's good to make sure you're recruiting vagrants regularly. Ideally, you'll want to have one or two vagrant camps that you visit once every day and recruit the vagrants there. You can also leave a coin on the floor at an empty vagrant camp, as vagrants appear roughly once every two minutes, and coins despawn after being on the ground for two minutes. So a vagrant should spawn and pick the coin up before it despawns, providing a greedling doesn't pick it up first. This also means it's not worth leaving more than one coin on the ground. Archers are useful behind your walls, but having archery towers is also very useful, as it can give them a clearer shot at the greed, and they're protected from most greed even if your walls are destroyed, so keep upgrading them as you upgrade your walls. One way to make all your archers more useful is by unlocking the Statue of Archery from the first island for 3 gems and 10 coins. Once activated, all your archers will be more accurate and do more damage, so it's a very useful one to grab. As you progress through the game, you unlock other ways to defend your kingdom. One of these is the catapult, which we mentioned earlier, and costs 6 coins to build once you've had a siege workshop spawn. A catapult needs at least one builder to operate and move it, but a second builder will speed up the process. The rocks they fire do a large amount of damage and can hit several units, so they're very good at clearing out large amounts of greedlings, but can also kill floaters in one hit and do a lot of damage to breeders. After unlocking the Siege Workshop, if you upgrade your town centre again, you gain the ability to buy fire barrels at the Siege Workshop. Each barrel costs 5 coins and will be rolled by a builder to the catapult. A catapult will prioritise using fire barrels over firing regular rocks, so they're generally far too expensive to bother buying them for regular night attacks, but can be incredibly useful for blood moons, as they create a temporary patch of fire on the ground, setting any greed on fire that passes through it. And dealing constant damage to them. This is especially useful for dealing with high health greed like breeders. It's worth noting that breeders move slower than greedlings, and so a single fire barrel may not last long enough to ignite the breeders in an attack wave, so it's good to have at least two or three barrels to get the most use out of them. One siege workshop can spawn on each side of your kingdom, and so you can have a catapult defending each side. Just remember to recruit a few extra builders to operate these catapults without disrupting any repairs or other building that you want to do. You'll also unlock your special units at the same time as the Siege Workshop. For the European campaign it's Spearmen, and for the Shogun campaign it's Ninjas. To recruit these, you'll need to expand your kingdom enough for their vendor to spawn, with one spawning on each side of your kingdom. Both of these units will fish during the day, earning you coins, and defend your kingdom during the night. Spearmen stay inside your walls and will poke any greed that pull right next to them, and can hit several at once, making them great for clearing out groups of greedlings. There's only room for one spearman to attack like this, and any others will stand behind the first, with their spears pointed upwards, which will attack any crown stealers that jump over the wall. A spearman's spear will break after it's killed a certain number of greed, and then the spearman loses its job. Despite this, the fishing they do quickly covers the cost of their recruitment, so it's always worth having at least a couple on each side of your kingdom. The ninjas defend differently, hiding in the nearest trees to your kingdom and waiting to ambush the greed from behind. Once they've killed a certain amount of greed, or if they get attacked, they'll use a smoke bomb to disappear and reappear within your walls, losing their job in the process. So, like pikemen, they generally cover the cost of their recruitment and add to your defences, so it's worth having at least a couple on each side. Another way to help your defences is with your choice of mount, and there's a lot to choose from, but to save time, I'll only mention what I think are the best two for defence. The Griffin is very versatile throughout the campaign, and its ability to push back greedlings and breeders can be valuable in preventing damage to your walls. The Lizard is slower and not as useful day to day, but its fire breath is fantastic on defence, 
able to ignite and kill many greed without having to spend lots of money on fire barrels. Both these mounts are also very useful at helping to defend the first knight after expanding your walls, so either one of them is a good defensive pick. That's definitely not everything there is to know about building, expanding and defending, but hopefully it's enough to help you on your journeys as a monarch. So that's everything for this time. If you enjoyed it then please like, subscribe and check out some of my other videos, but until then, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.